webinar on tax considerations for captives. Here you see the topics, what we would like to discuss with you, starting with the traditional world, tax development and the captive case, then focusing on the final version of the BEPS actions 1 to 15, going on with implication of BEPS report and concerns for your captive, for the captive owners, and then Paul will present the Zurich solution. Traditional world, that's what we are starting with. And on the next slide, you see uh, captive insurance, which are risk financing tool, and it is essential for stable business operations. They are not part of the tax avoidance business. Nevertheless, in certain cases, it is also possible to achieve some tax benefits. On this slide, you see a traditional tax saving scheme for captives. Firstly, the profit of the captive is taxed at low rates because the captive is located in a tax-friendly environment. Secondly, the insurance premiums paid by the group companies are tax deductible. Thirdly, dividends paid by the captive do not suffer any withholding tax or only a very low one. And last but not least, incoming dividends are not taxed in the hands of the parent. On the next slide, you see some traditional points of attack of the tax authorities in the pre-BEBS world. In some cases and in some countries, insurance premiums are not recognized to be tax deductible. The tax authorities are, for example, arguing that there is no risk shifting and or no risk distribution, or they were saying that the premiums were not at arm's length, that the profits of the captive is too high, and so on. The controlled foreign corporation legislation, the CFC legislation, has been existing for decades in certain countries. As you can see, the CFC legislation is by no means an invention of BEPS, but BEPS is encouraging the countries to introduce or reinforce their CFC legislation. The consequence of an existing CFC legislation can be that the profits of the captives are fully or partially taxed at the level of the parent company. Sometimes the captive itself is taxed in the country of the parent company or in a third country because the tax administration thinks that the captive is effectively managed there and not where the captive is legally domiciled. Or the tax administration argues that the captive has a branch in the country where members of the captive management are resident. We will see later that BEPS has considerably widened the notion of a branch of a permanent establishment as we uh, tax people call a branch. Sometimes dividends paid by captives are not tax exempt in the hands of the parent because captives are considered to be tax wise a portfolio company and not a real insurance company. This is, for instance, the case for dividends paid by a Swiss captive to its Swedish parent if the captive does not have to pay for many damages. OECD harmful tax competition and EU code of conduct could also be an issue for captives. You might record the discussion in connection with Luxembourg captives in the late 90s. On this slide, uh, you see a little captive case study where I was involved. It was the case of a Swiss captive being challenged by the Dutch tax authorities, but this could have happened in many other countries. The profits of a Swiss captive insuring medical devices sold by the Dutch OPCO were taxed in this case by the Dutch FISC in the hands of the Dutch holding company, the parent of the Swiss captive. 
The Dutch tax authorities were arguing that the Swiss captive was only insuring one company, namely the Dutch OPCO. That the effective management of the captive was in Holland and that the insurance premiums paid by Dutch OPCO were too high. To mitigate this unfair double taxation, we started a mutual agreement procedure as foreseen in the Dutch-Swiss double tax treaty. And it was finally possible to find a solution how to split the captive's profits between Switzerland and Holland. As you can see, the Dutch FISC did not accept the captive setup. I am aware of other cases where the Dutch revenue took a closer look at internal reinsurance. So much about the pre-BEPS world. Now, as you know, the OECD announced the BEPS action plan in June 2013 and in October 2015 the final BEPS reports for actions 1 to 15 were published. Before we look at these um, various BEPS action, maybe an important question, what is BEPS? What does it mean? BEPS means base erosion and profit shifting. Base erosion and profit shifting and not base expansion and profit stealing as you can sometimes hear. It refers to tax planning strategies that exploit gaps loopholes and mismatches in tax rules to make profits disappear for tax purposes or to shift profits to countries where there is little or no real activity and where taxes are low resulting in little or no overall corporate tax to be paid. Now, why should we worry about base erosion and profit shifting, which is legal? Well, the main concern of the OECD is that BEPS distorts competition and gives companies that operate cross-border a competitive advantage. It is also an issue of fairness when taxpayers see multinational corporations legally avoiding income tax it undermines voluntary compliance by all taxpayers. Now, revenue losses from BEPS are estimated at 100 to 240 US billion US dollar, billion, not million, 100 to 240 billion annually or 4 to 10% of global corporate income tax revenue. Angel Juria, the Gener Secretary General, said BEPS affects all countries, not only economically, but also as a matter of trust. Legal tax planning practice seems more and more in conflict with changing public perception of tax fairness and morale. Just think of Starbucks, Google, Apple and similar cases. The BEPS action plan should provide governments with solutions for closing the gaps in existing international tax rules that allow corporate profits to disappear or to be artificially shifted to low, no tax environments where little or no economic activity takes place. On this slide you see all the 15 actions, 1 to 15. In connection with captives, action three, dealing with CFC, action four, deduction of interest and other financial payments, action seven, about permanent establishments, and action 10, that's transfer pricing or particular interest. Further, action 13, country by country reporting, is also an important topic for captives. These reports have identified base erosion and profit shifting issues. They announced changes to the OECD model tax convention and to the existing transfer pricing guidelines. And above all, they issue recommendations regarding the design of domestic rules to avoid bids. 
what are the implications of the BEPS report? What are the concerns for captive owners? In general, I think that it is fair to say that the OECD BEPS writers did not properly understand the role and the function of captive reinsurance companies. There are several references to captives in the report, but actually almost always in a negative context. The reference to captives misusing their structure for tax circumvention or tax avoidance is rather unfair. The OECD did obviously not understand that captives are extremely valuable risk management <coughs> instruments. The specific focus on captive is targeted. Captives are unfairly singled out. Now, let us focus on certain action, starting with action three. Action three is encouraging countries to introduce and strengthen their CFC legislation. Depending on the local legislation in the country of the parent company, captive structures in low or zero tax jurisdiction are very much at risk. Action 3 issues recommendations on how to define CFT income. There is a reference to insurance income which derives from contracts or policy with related party and where the group companies were benefiting from a tax deduction for premium pay. This insurance income should be considered as CFC income and taxed in the hands of the parent. The content of Action 3 is not meant to be a minimum standard, it is only a recommendation. Thanks God, countries are free to decide not to introduce CFC legislation or not to enforce any already existing CFC rules. Action 4 is limited, limiting base erosion involving interest deductions and other financial payments. It recommends that countries should implement a so-called fixed ratio rule that would limit net interest deduction claimed by an entity. The limitation is a fixed percentage of 10 to 13 percent of earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. In other words, before EBIT stuff. Captives with loan financing could be subject to this 10 to 30 percent limitation. Also, specific rules for bank and insurance company will be issued in 2016. Now, the reason for this is that captives are explicitly excluded from these specific rules, despite of the fact that they are regulated insurance companies. Again, this, is the, this demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding by the OECD of the role and function of a captive. Action 7 deals with the prevention of the so-called artificial avoidance of permanent establishments. The definition of a permanent establishment has been widened considerably. This is particularly relevant for captives where individuals in the group risk departments are also managing or directing the captive. To the extent these individuals are exercising their function outside the captive location or even dealing with a third party provider, this could trigger a permanent establishment of the captive in the territory where these individuals are residing or exercising their function. Actions 8 to 10 are dealing with aligning transfer pricing outcome with value creation. The existing OECD transfer pricing guidelines have been updated. Action 10 is focusing on high-risk areas, including the profit allocation from transactions that are not 
quote, OECD commercially rationale for their individual enterprise concerned, unquote, OECD. In other words, the profit allocation can be recharacterized if the tax authorities are of the opinion that the transaction does not have the commercial rationale of arrangements that would be agreed between unrelated parties. In such case, the tax authorities could, for instance, deny the deduction of insurance premiums which have been paid. The final guidance includes a negative example where a captive is giving insurance protection where there is no third-party market. The OECD did not realize that captives allow their owners to insure risk which are, to a certain extent, uninsurable in the traditional insurance market. In this example, the conclusion is that the insurance arrangement is commercially irrational since there is no market for insurance protection and since there is a very high likelihood of significant claims. Accordingly, the insurance premiums paid by the group company are not tax deductible in this example. Further, the captive has to demonstrate control over a risk, otherwise the return of the risk will be allocated to another group company. Accordingly, the captive should have competent and experienced decision makers who have access to information relevant to take the risk. Action 13 introduces new country-by-country -country reporting requirements for large multinational enterprises. This report has to be filed on an annual basis in each jurisdiction in which the group is doing business. The report has to include the profit before tax, the taxes paid or accrued, the number of employees, the capital, and so on. Now, significant mismatches in the level of profits reported by the captive, the capital base it holds, and the number of people it employs will lead to challenging questions by the tax administration. And this will require time-consuming and detailed explanations. What are our conclusions? Is the future of captives a risky business? At least this was the title of a recent Big Four publication claiming that the implication for those groups using captives as risk financing tools are significant. It is clear that the OECD is focusing on substance and realigning the profits where the people are. This is certainly a very critical issue for captives and it will be crucial to provide clear evidence of the commercial substance in the location of the captive. Further, to avoid a permanent establishment issue, you have to prove that you have got the right substance in the right place at the right time to avoid an unintentional tax footprint where you do not want to have it. Finally, under the new OECD guidelines, the tax authorities have the potential to recharacterize a transaction so they can disallow the tax deduction for premiums. In the previously mentioned example, the guideline suggests that if there is no commercial cover available, writing it through the captive is not commercially rational, which is particularly worrying. There is a big concern that this could lead to a Wild West or cowboy allocation of taxing rights. It is clear that captives are firmly on the tax radar screen of the OECD. It is important to be prepared for these fundamental changes and to develop a comprehensive impact assessment. Together maybe with a plan for how to substantiate price and document the captive arrangement. A clear documentation is required why the captive chose its domicile. Further, a demonstration that risk management is the main purpose of the captive. And finally, you have to show that decisions are made by captive personnel who understand the business and all aspects of the corporation risks. Before I turn on the session to Paul, 
I would like to encourage you to send us your question. Paul, the floor is yours. Olivier, many thanks for your great explanations. <coughs> Let us start with our first slide. Uh, our observation from the Zurich point of view across international markets is that most of the captive op captives operate as reinsurance companies and do participate on frequency risks based on known proportional reinsurance structures. We have experienced that only a few captive owner business segments like the banking industry or the mining industry regularly follow proportional gross sessions which include retro session panels behind the captives. The interest of risk managers is directed to keep the captive healthy. In other words, that the captive is from a financial point of view strong enough to pay all claims which are reported from the fronting insurer. In order to meet requirements either from insurance regulators or from tax authorities, Zurich has developed a comprehensive captive governance framework across all global corporate regions. For each individual and line of business specific captive reinsurance program, we analyze and assess the captive session, the exposure, and under two types of checks. Firstly, insurance related, and secondly, finance related checks or topics. All results of those assessments are captured and monitored in a worldwide captive database. When we draw our attention now to the next slide, please, <coughs> we see firstly the insurance related topics. Based on the underwriting input, we mathematically assess a sufficient risk transfer in order to make sure that each transaction qualifies as a reinsurance transaction rather than as a financial transaction. We then perform an at arm's length check. What is in this context arm's length, of course? I would like to provide you with the following definition. The price charged by one related party to another for a transaction must be within the same range as the price charged where the parties are not related. Tax authorities want to verify, of course, that captive owners are not avoiding taxes by paying excessive premiums to their captives. And it is important for the customer, mainly due to legal and tax reasons, and for the Zurich, that premiums ceded to a captive in a fronting transaction are at arm's length. For this reason, we first firstly establish feasible premium range based on the customer data for the specific risks and a standardized and consistent analytical methodology as well as based on our pricing tools. If the intended captive premium exceeds this premium range, we are checking whether there are legitimate reasons why the intended captive premium is exceeding this range. In the rare in the rare case where no such legitimate reasons can be identified, the excess captive premium will not be paid to the captive. This check is performed for each captive transaction on a B annual basis. Thus, such checks are necessary because large international corporations may perform during the insurance period merger and acquisition transactions in their core businesses, which impact the calculated premium amount per line of business. Let us now move on with the financial related topics on the right hand side of the slide. Any credit risk assessment aims to make sure that Zurich's, Zurich's customers, captives are strong enough to pay upcoming claims. A financial analyst team benchmarks per reinsurance program the calculated credit risk exposure with the financial strength of the balance sheet of the captive, provided that the net captive assets are strong enough to respond to the calculated credit risk exposure 
no additional collaterals will be requested, provided that net captive assets are not strong enough to respond to the calculated creditor's exposure, the cedent initiates a respective collateral discussion. A range of collateral options can be used, like letter of credit, current guarantees, and so on, as you certainly know. Captive financial assessments get performed on an annual basis using audited financials of the captive and the parent. Now, what can Zurich do for you. We keep all premium relevant information present and provided on request of the customer. This filing applies for the insurance level as well as for the reinsurance level. We assist the customer in raising awareness and understanding of the captive structure with authorities. Finally, a standardized process across all global corporate regions where Zurich issues international insurance programs that are due to captive reinsurances gets reviewed on a yearly basis in order to make sure that parameters are kept up to date. This provides to our customers a level of captive compliance confidence. Shall we, shall we now move on with the questions? I I have seen that a lot of have been come in. May I start, Oliver, with the first question uh, which are here on the on the screen? Here's a question, Olivier. What is the nature of the BEPS outputs? Are they legally binding? Now, this is an important question. Thank you for asking this question. Now, uh, they are soft law instruments. They are not legally binding, but there is an expectation that they will be implemented accordingly by the countries. However, there are also a few minimum standards, such as country by country reporting. Further, some existing standards, such as transfer pricing guidelines, have been updated. In the meantime, another question has come. Uh, regarding the Zurich part, uh, the, I read the question, can you please outline how you can make sure that the captive referral within Zurich gets followed consistently? Well, Olivier, this is certainly a complex uh, question. Let me, let me try to answer as, uh, as follows. Having a place, a proper guideline frame is one of important requirement, of course. In, in addition, it is of importance that you are able to escalate justifiable exceptions where standard calculations do not fit. Then, finally, the most important requirement, you need to have access to various experienced experts, including pricing mathematics specialists, trained, and this is important, trained to work closely in a team together. So, we in Zurich, have centralized our operational captive team in Switzerland that makes this happen for the countries in Europe, in Asia Pacific, and for the countries in Latin America. Furthermore, of course, all captive reinsurance agreements ceded from these regions get signed and executed by us in Zurich so we can monitor each and every contract. I've, I've just seen, Olivier, another important question has come in for you, if I may address a question to you. Uh, here's a question, Olivier. Will intra-group contract be respected? Um, now, this question goes back to Action 10 of the OECD, uh, based on which it is possible in certain cases to recharacterize a uh, transaction. For instance, if the contracts are incomplete or are not supported by the effective conduct, the analysis of the tax authorities should clarify and supplement the contractual arrangement. In other words, in certain cases, the contractual framework will not be respected. Remember the case I mentioned 
where the captive uh, gave insurance protection in a case where third party insurance protection was not available because uh, the transaction or the, the insurance would have been too risky. Okay, one, one last question probably out of uh, 20 questions which we have received many miles in addition. Seems to be a little bit difficult. How does the guidance deal with the allocation of risk? Tax planning strategies based on mere contractual allocation of risk unsupported by business operations are not sufficient to reallocate risk. To assume a risk, the associated enterprise needs to exercise meaningful and specifically defined control over the, the risk. And also, it's important to have the financial capacity to assume the risk. Now, if this is not the case, the enterprise, in our case a captive, will only be entitled to a risk-free return. This means it will not be entitled to the full premium income. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have still time to, to take another another <coughs> question, perhaps? Uh, Olivier, we'll look here. Yes. Do controlled foreign corporation CFC rules create a risk of double taxation? Well, I think the answer is yes. Um, imagine the case where the CFC income is also subject to foreign corporate taxes. In other words, it's not only taxed in the hands of the parent, but also in the country where the CFC is. Or maybe the case where a CFC has distributed dividends out of the income that has already been taxed under the CFC rules in the hands of the parent company. Now, to avoid this increased risk of double taxation, the OECD report recommends that CFC rules include certain provisions, for instance, for foreign tax credits or dividend exemption. But um, it's unfortunately true, uh, the um, Action 3, increasing the CFC rules will also increase the risk of double taxation. May I ask another one which has just, uh, <coughs> which we have just received, please? That the question, uh, there appears to be more concern about BEPS impact on captives from owners in Europe than in America. Is this a trend that you have heard or recognized, Olivier? Well, this is also an interesting question because um, we have realized in all these BEPS meetings and discussions that the uh, USA is more reluctant to introduce uh, BEPS recommendation. The US are a powerful nation and uh, it's a different situation in Europe where the countries are more closely together and have, individually speaking, less power. And also within Europe you have an additional <clears throat> point, that's the European Union, which is also uh, implementing the BEPS recommendation at the BEPS level. So I can confirm what has been asked. Uh, Captive uh, BEPS seems to be more important in Europe than in the United States. Mm -hmm. Many thanks. <clears throat> what do we have? Another okay. Here, here we are with a traditional model of board meetings being held in the domicile. Insurances, documents signed in domicile and management outsource locally be sufficient to meet PE scrutiny for you. I'm afraid in future that will not be sufficient because um, it is important that uh, people deciding in the captives 
are also located where the captive is located in order to avoid any permanent establishment issue. I'm not sure there is really a solution for this. Um, so uh, you have to be careful and to have, have as much substance as possible in the location where the captive is. And you should also have people who are entitled to make decision and who understand the mechanism of risk taking. They should be located in the location where the captive is. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we have another one. Yes, is the BEPS project effectively a tax increase on multinational? Well, basically, the OECD said that uh, non taxation or low taxation per se is not a concern, but it could become a concern when it is achieved through practices that uh, artificially separate taxable income from the activities that generate it. Now, what I just said is a quotation of the OECD, I repeat it, artificially separate taxable income from the activities that generate it. The OECD is claiming that the BEPS action will give business greater certainty and reinforce the fairness and consistency of an international tax system. Note, I certainly do not agree with this OECD statement, but I think it's fair to say that the BEPS project will um, have as an effect an increase of the tax burden of the multinationals. Olivier, we have the pleasure that you are today with us as, as the BEPS expert from the Swiss side, of course. So uh, a lot of risk managers who do participate to this call might be interested. Where could they get additional information regarding BEPS development? Do you have perhaps any recommendations for respective sources? So where our risk managers and uh, today's uh, participants of the call could more or less get more information, documentation, and how do they get updated? Well, I think the best way would be to follow up on the OECD homepage. Um, and um, of course, all these reports are quite long. Imagine uh, 12,000 pages have been published by the OECD in connection with the BEPS action plan. 12,000 pages. Um, I'm still on page 11,000. Um, so um, I think it's important that you also realize that there are executive summaries on the uh, OECD BEPS homepage so that you don't need to read all the 12,000 pages. Okay, many thanks, interesting. May I, may I refer back to uh, our moderator, Nick uh, Morgan, in order to uh, provide probably a quick uh, summary or a closing from, uh, from our side? Uh, yes, we are. We are ready to return to you, please. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, both to Olivier and Paul yourself. Um, I think we found that was a, a hugely interesting topic. I think there's lots more questions to be answered, and in fact, you know, questions have still come in. But we will, uh, we will perhaps forward these questions after the link, and maybe they can answer them directly. Um, I know one of the questions that has been asked by a few people during the session, which is, are these uh, slides going to be available. Yes, we shall share the presentation, and then at a, at a later date, we will also host the webinar uh, as an archive file on CaptiveReview.com. So I think from now, it's really thank you for all who have, have taken the time uh, to dial in. I think a huge thank you again uh, to Zurich Insurance Company um, and uh, to. Um, Pestalozzi attorneys, both Paul and Olivier, for such good content. Um, and should you have any questions, your contact details for the two presenters are on the screen now. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with them as and when you feel uh, you would like to. 
Okay, so for now, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much.